Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Sandy Toplinski. Uh, Sandy, uh, you experienced at a young age as a young Jewish girl a lot of anti-Semitism. Here in America, you think of a little, but you don't think of a lot. Not typically. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was overtly anti-Semitic. We live not far from former Nazi headquarters in the city of Chicago, of all places. And so as just as a kid, I grew up having to defend myself physically. I um, would be beat up on playgrounds and learn to fight back very quickly, and maybe in some instances a little bit too effectively. But underlying all of that was a driving knowledge to know the God that I was uh, fighting for, so to speak. Now, uh, what type of synagogue did you go it to? It was very religious. It was, um, you could call it orthodox. Did you like the synagogue? I did. I found um, great comfort there. I can't remember a time not believing in God. And I, as a result of that, soon grew disillusioned by the time I read about bat mitzvah time because I wanted so much with all of my heart to love the Lord with all of my heart as our scriptures command, as our cornerstone prayer in Judaism commands us to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I saw no one, not even the devout rabbi who did. And so I embarked on a search to be able to find out how I could love this God. And now, you, know, you know, that that is so amazing. Before we started the show, I told you this. Uh, we're both Jewish. We both come from traditional Jewish backgrounds. But for me, I couldn't wait to get out of the synagogue. <laughs> and God wasn't even in my thoughts. And as far as personally knowing him, like Moses did and David did, I didn't even give a thought to that. So would you say you were obsessed with knowing God? I was a little bit obsessed. In fact, in <laughs> fact, In fact, Sid, um, I became uh, very upset that I could not know God the same way Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, nor did I see anybody who did. And I remember asking questions of my parents and the rabbis, and nobody had an answer for me. It was simply, God doesn't relate to people like that anymore. But something in me wouldn't settle for that. Okay, you get to college, mm -hmm. and now you find a different style of anti-Semitism. It's not having to fight with your fists, <laughs> fortunately. It's a little more sophisticated. Tell me about it. Well, it was called evangelism in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, the people that were out uh, uh, selling their spiritual wares, so to speak, back in the 70s when I went to college, saw me as ripe pickings, I think. And the uh, Christian campus evangelists who were out there, uh, to my perception, assaulted me with their tracts and with their gospel witness. And so, so why didn't you do what most Jewish people do? And they say, I'm Jewish, I'm not interested, good riddance. I did. <laughs> I did. So that should have that, been it. Well, it should have been it, except that I was so uh, perturbed over this continual b harassment of Jesus in my life. Now, remember, um, I grew up post-Holocaust uh, era, and, and one thing we didn't talk about is that I was just simply barraged with instructions from the synagogue, you must never let Christians take your faith away, you must never let Christians harm the Jews again, never again. And so I view this as an opportunity to fight fire with fire, to disprove the gospel, to disprove this ridiculous allegation of a virgin birth. And so I went and bought myself a New Testament, read it for the first time. I was all set to write out the arguments against it. I was in school, by, way, by the way, studying to be an attorney. And to my shock, I found that the words that I read in the New Testament, when I read it for myself and thought for myself, were filled with a power and a love like I had never experienced in any of my other religious studies or pursuits as I dabbled in different Eastern religions. And so I read the New Testament on my own from cover to cover. I researched back into the Old Testament prophecies, which I knew enough of from my many years of Hebrew training. And it became very clear to me that this Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew, as we now call him, is indeed the promised Messiah of Israel. Yes, but if a rabbi 
heard about this, he'd say, Sandy, you're no longer a Jew. Now that's important for you to be Jewish, isn't it? Well, you know, Sid, I've come to the place where it is important to me to be Jewish. It's very important. But it's, what's more important to me is not what people call me. You know, I mean, the Bible says that if we're more concerned with what other people think of us, then we're not a Jew. A Jew is one who is concerned with the praises and exaltation of God. Do you know God? Yes, I do. Do you remember that young girl that had a heart to know God and couldn't find anyone in the synagogue that really had intimacy with God? She has it now. And what she has found out, you must know, your very life is dependent on it. We'll be right back after this word. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter, here with Sandy Toplinski. Uh, before we go back with Sandy, one of the things that I see beyond reading the words of Jesus, and I don't see how anyone could read the words of Jesus, Jewish person, Muslim person, uh, anyone could read his words without having their heart pierced with this amazing, and that's the only word I can come up with, amazing love. But the major way that Jewish people are coming to know the Messiah of Israel is through the supernatural. I want you to look at a video clip of Gary Goldberg de Stefano, who is a Jewish woman that certainly did not believe in Jesus, that was healed of over 30 incurable diseases. Let's take a look now. My name is Gary Goldberg Di Stefano. I grew up in Long Island, New York, and I led a pretty active life involving a lot of sports. In July of 1983, I survived a horrific car crash. I was broken in half from my neck down. The entire right side of my body broke off the steering wheel. I lost all the cartilage in both knees and was horizontal for the next two years. When the car stopped, uh, I was trapped inside the car, which was on fire. And I have no explanation except for God and adrenaline for how I got out of the car. I spent the next two years trying to get vertical, moved down to Florida where I thought heat would be better for me. Of course, humidity was quite painful. And God kept sending people into my path to talk to me about this Jewish God named Jesus. And I really didn't want to have anything to do with this God. I'm Jewish, I'm from New York, I was in a lot of pain, and I kept telling them I have a weapon and I'll hurt them if they don't stop talking to me. They did not stop talking to me, but it really wasn't doing anything for my pain. Uh, two men in particular, one Greek and one half Jewish, one half Italian named Peter, uh, gave me a Bible, which I read, and again, nothing was helping my pain. Eight and a half years after the accident, I herniated a disc which paralyzed the left side of my body and basically I was out of sides. My plan was to end my life and I looked at my gun and realized I'm such a klutz, if I shoot myself, I'll still be here and in worse shape than I already was. And so I decided to pray. Now these people had been trying to get me to say a prayer that basically said that Jesus died for me rose again and was living. And this concept of a living God was very alien to my Jewish heart. I knew there was a God, Jehovah God, the big God, and he lived in the temple. And if you didn't go to that building, you didn't really have to deal with him. So it was, it was hard for me to agree to say that particular prayer because it would have been a lie, and if he really was God, that would not be a good way to curry favor. So this is the prayer that I said. I said, Jesus, if you are really God, like they tell me, then you know what I'm going to do. So instead of me doing it, you do it. I give my life to you. Do with it what you will. Amen. As soon as I said amen, a hand took my shoulder, lifting me straight up off the floor. A surge of energy came through me. A sack filled with demons came out of my neck, disappeared into the air. And hallelujah, 39 things got healed in an instant. You know, a new phenomenon is going on. What happened to Gary is happening to people all over the world, not just Jewish people. In fact, I have good news for you. You don't have to be Jewish to believe in Jesus. God so loves the whole world. But I believe 
that many of you have had miracles, and you certainly have a little video camera at home, why not talk just like Gary did right now of what God did, what miracle he did, uh, two, three minutes, send it to us, we'll check it out, and if it's legitimate, we'll put it on the air. And I want to prove a point that God is working throughout the entire earth right now, not in superstars, but through the superstar. The superstar is Jesus. It, the superstar is Jesus. I, I have Sandy Toplinski here right now, and uh, I am uh, overwhelmed with that testimony that we just saw. But I'm also overwhelmed with an experience that you had involving Israel. Tell me about that time that you felt what God feels about the nation Israel. This was um, about, oh, almost 25 years ago. And it was long before I was acquainted with supernatural phenomena. And I was just merely going about my business, cleaning my house, worshiping God, singing, cleaning my house. And suddenly, a great sense of anguish enveloped me like I'd never experienced before. Um, when I think of it, the best way that I can describe it would be to call it very sad garbage. And it was as if it enveloped me and broke my heart. Now, I am a former attorney, and so while this was happening, I was analyzing this, and I was thinking, perhaps I am having a nervous breakdown. This is something I, I, I have no grid for. Um, but within seconds, the Lord's presence overshadowed all that. And he spoke very clearly to my heart and said, this is how I feel about my people, Israel. And what I experienced was the Lord's heartache and heartbreak and his grieving at his beholding of our sin and yet the everlasting love of a father whose arms nonetheless uphold his errant children, but who grieves and who pants for the return of those children. And so I fell to the floor under the weight of it and started wailing. Now at this point, I really thought I might be having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and I remember stuffing a pillow into my mouth because oh, of the no. wails, thinking that my neighbors could well call the police. <laughs> I did not understand then what many of us know now is that the Holy Spirit can deposit a supernatural intercessory burden like that so that we can stand in the gap. The scriptures say that God looks for someone to stand in the gap to pray on behalf of Israel or the nations or both um, to mediate God's mercy. And so um, that was really the beginning of a change in me that resulted, I believe, from a deposit of God's heart. And of course, over the years, the Lord has added to that and brought revelation and so on. The bottom line, Sandy, is you wrote a book called Why Care About Israel? And that's a passion for you. It is. Why care about Israel? It's a passion for me, Sid, because bottom line, it's a passion for God. I have a passion for God. We've known each other over the years, and our paths have crossed in our mutual pursuit of God. God is passionate for Israel. He makes it very clear in the Word that that passion is everlasting. Beginning with Genesis 12:3, he says that he will bless those who bless Israel, meaning the lineal physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he will curse those who curse them. And of course, we go into much more detail on that in the book. And so the lives of believers today, not just, uh, I'm not just speaking to, to Jews, but to Gentile believers are affected to the extent that they choose to bless or curse Israel. Now that principle, that biblical principle is not passe. What we need to understand, what the church needs to understand in this hour is that those same principles apply to us today and even increasingly more so as we find ourselves at odds with a global mounting anti-Semitism. Hold that thought. Let me tell you something. There's a new 
new type of anti-Semitism on the scene, you must understand. We'll be right back after this word. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Sandy Toplinski. And Sandy, just before the break, I said there is a new type of anti-Semitism that is moving so strongly, it's scary. Explain. The new anti-Semitism, as it's called by the Jewish community, not just the Messianic Jewish community, refers to the fact that historically, as you know, the Jewish people have been persecuted and victimized by anti-Semitism, which by the way is just the flip side of the spirit of Antichrist. They are both anti-God. Um, in whatever nations the Jewish people lived. They were hunted down, they were persecuted, they were killed. Now that there is an established state of Israel, the anti-Semitism is today being cloaked in a thin veneer and politically, allegedly politically correctly being called uh, anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism or anti-Israeli policies. Um, now, we're not saying that to disagree with Israel is tantamount to being anti-Semitic. That's not the case right. at all. But what we are saying is that th around the globe, and particularly in Western Europe, we're finding that there is such an across the board uh, disdain and castigation of the nation of Israel the, uh, and an, equ an equating of Israel with Nazism, of and all you things. Know, it is, um it's not a natural phenomena, Sandy. It's not, no. I mean, we, we're both fairly logical type thinkers. This isn't a logical thing that is going on right now, no. especially as you point out, even the, uh, from a historical viewpoint, uh, who should have that land. But beyond historical, what is God's position and, and how dangerous it is for a Christian to be on the wrong side of the fence. But it's like fuel going into a fire from a supernatural origin. Absolutely. Anti-Semitism or the hatred of the Jewish people is ultimately demonic in nature. And I'll tell you, the enemy is fighting very hard right now to destroy and annihilate Israel through fanatical Islam and the Palestinian conflict uh, for several reasons. But one prime reason is that he knows, the devil knows, that if he can annihilate Israel and destroy the Jews, that he can, so he thinks, thwart the return of the Lord Yeshua because the scriptures tell us that it is to a Jewish city and a Jewish homeland that Jesus will return. Well, what, you, you, on your book you say how the Jewish nation is key to unleashing God's blessings in the 21st century, but there is a flip side to that, mm -hmm. and that is the curses. How dangerous it is it for a Christian to be involved in something like replacement theology where they believe the church has replaced Israel, the church has all the promises, Israel has held the curses. How dangerous is that? Well, it's extremely dangerous. First of all, we, go, we can go back to Genesis 12, 3, in which God says, I will curse those who curse the descendants of Israel. We can go to the book of Obadiah, who says in verse 15, as you have treated Israel, so will God treat you. And we can go to Romans 11, where the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, specifically addresses replacement theology. And he says in uh, verse 1, has God rejected the Jews? No. And then he goes on to say, that uh, in, uh, in verse 12 that, um, that those who are conceited towards the Jews or, or arrogant, they themselves uh, stand uh, the chance of having their own life in, in Christ uh, cut off. Now, uh, that he continues that on in verse 20. Um, and, and so he is warning us. In fact, he says that he, Paul specifically says he does not want us to be ignorant. And he says that less than a handful of times in all of scriptures. He's warning us, he says, don't be ignorant uh, that God has not forsaken the Jewish people, that those who believe he has stand to have their own faith cut off, and that there is only a hardening in part on Israel until the fullness, the full maturity, Messiah-likeness of the Gentiles comes in. Flip and side, what's in it 
if someone is a blessing to the Jew in Israel? Uh, if somebody blesses the, the Jewish people, and uh, we go into it much more detail in our book, but bottom line, you get more of Jesus. Now, all over the world, we hear people saying, I want more of God, more of the Holy Spirit, you, more you know, of Jesus. You know, Sandy, I'm reminded of the young Jewish girl, Sandy, that said, I want to know God. I want to know Him. Now she says, I want to be, have more and more. Each day I want to have more of God. And the key to intimacy with God is following God's Word. God says, I want obedience, not sacrifice. And Sandy is saying that her intimacy is increasing by her love for the Jewish people. And to see the Jewish people in place so that the Gentile people can be in place, so the whole world can be in place, so that Jesus can return. How about you? It goes right down to you personally. Do you want to know God? It's not an accident that you're watching us right now. The same God that loves Sandy, the same God that loves me, died for you. And you may not understand everything I'm explaining to you right now, but understand this, you are special, you have purpose, there is destiny on your life, and knowing God is way beyond going to a church on Sunday or a Messianic Jewish congregation on Saturday. There is an intimacy that God wants to have with you. It is vital that you hear God's voice. It is vital that you experience His love. There is a portion of you that has never experienced love has never experienced true peace. I mean peace that is so tangible, you reach out and touch it. I have, Sandy has, because first of all, we recognize that we're sinners. We recognize that we have done many things wrong. The Ten Commandments you can't see in a public school, but you know what they are, and we've all violated them. If we go to God and we say, God, I am sorry, Please forgive me. I believe that the blood of Jesus washes away my sins, and I am clean. And now that I am clean, I boldly proclaim that Jesus is my Messiah and Lord. Come inside of me, become real to me. And if you reach out for God from that invisible realm, God will reach out to you. It has never been easier in the history of the world. Why? Because God is drawing closer to planet Earth. It is vital. Now, now is the day of your salvation. Don't wait one second more. Get right with God.